going through Matthew. Uh, there's just a few things in here in Matthew. We'll just go through it really quickly um, that I thought would be interesting if, because uh, I know Matthew 2 is a very familiar passage. <coughs> Matthew 2. Have you got a Bible, Elizabeth? You yeah. Is Edna need one? You can give her that one. You can use this. Matthew 2. All right, we'll go through it really quick. Hopefully it won't spend more than 10 or 15 minutes. Matthew 2. Anyway, before we start, let's just pray. All right, dear Lord, thank you for gathering us here. We just pray, Lord, that you'll bless our night. Um, just bless the fellowship, Lord. Bless the prayer. And just pray, Lord, that as we read through Matthew 2 now, um, that you would speak to us. And um, Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus for coming and um, just seeing all the prophecies that he fulfilled in this chapter. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so Matthew 2, we're just going to go through really quickly. Matthew 2, let's just start at verse 1. Uh, now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So we're still at the beginning of Matthew. This is obviously the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I find really interesting about the New Testament, because, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, those stories of Jesus, they're just myths, they're just made up stories. But when you have these, these historical crosshairs, it's really hard for people to argue that the Bible is just made up stories. For example, you know, you have a particular figure, Herod the king, and he's saying, hey, at this time when Herod was king. So that's a historical crosshair that somebody can check and say, hey, did Jesus actually live at this time? Another example, if you turn to Luke 3, this is a really good example in the Gospels in Luke 3 of just these historical crosshairs that are set, just sort of this evidence that the Gospels are not just made up stories. Luke 3 verse 1, it says here, now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, right? so that's pretty specific, isn't it? The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, so we all know that Pontius Pilate was the one that oversee, oversaw you know, Jesus' trial um, when he was sent to be crucified, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, so you see there's all these names of all these people in power at different places. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, if somebody doesn't start a fairy tale or a lie with that sort of beginning, right? That would be like saying, hey, you know, there's somebody, you know, living in 2018, you know, when, um, you know, I, I forget, I don't even know who's the Prime Minister of Australia these days, but Scott Morrison's Prime Minister of Australia and, you know, Pope Francis is the Pope and giving all these uh, different names of all these, these high-ranking people and saying, hey, at that time, this is when John the Baptist came. So it's not just long ago in a galaxy far, far away, like a lot of fairy tales start. All right, let's go on to uh, verse 3 in Matthew 2. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. So why was he troubled, right? Because his authority is at stake, isn't it? Because he hears about this king being born and he's worried. And all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now think of this attitude of King Herod. It's not just that another king from another country is coming to usurp authority over him. He acknowledges that the one the wise men are coming to seek is Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And, and yet he wants to usurp. He, he, he has a problem with God in the flesh coming and taking his authority. Now, obviously, this is a wicked king. But oftentimes, you know, as Christians, we have that attitude too, right? We don't want Jesus Christ to rule in our life. And that's, a, that's one reason why, you know, a lot of atheists don't believe in God. A lot of people don't want to get saved. It's not because there's no evidence. It's not because there's no eyewitness testimony of Jesus Christ or a Bible that is no, like no other book. It's because they just don't want a God telling them what to do, right? They just don't want Jesus to be a ruler and, and, and being the Lord and because they don't like that, they don't even want to believe on him as savior. You know? So verse 5, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now you might be wondering when you read that in Matthew and say, how did these scribes, or how did these, uh, these um, uh, I guess, uh, these, uh, these prophets, uh, is that what we said? Uh, the chief priests and scribes, right? So I got it right the first time. How did they know that this prophecy was talking about Jesus Christ? Well, if you go to Micah 5.2, where this prophecy is actually quoted in Micah 5.2, it says here, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And look at this. This is what's not quoted in Matthew 2. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Right? So this is how they knew this was, this was a prophecy of the coming Messiah. But it's interesting that when King Herod inquires of the scribes and the priests where Christ should be born, this was like common knowledge that, hey, when the Messiah comes, he will be born in Bethlehem. All right, let's go back to Matthew 2, verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privily or secretly called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So what is Herod trying to do now? He's trying to figure out Hey, well, when they're saying they saw, they saw his star in the east, he's trying to figure out, well, how old is this child, right? Because if they're coming here, you know, three months later, and he's saying, hey, well, when did the star appear? And they're saying, hey, well, we saw it three months ago. He's like, okay, well, this child is about this old, and we'll see that later in the chapter. So they see the star appear in the east, and then they come over. And, you know, this is one thing that's interesting, because, you know, when you see the cartoons or you see the wise men, they're generally just following this star that's always in front of them. But... I don't know whether that's generally the case. I think they saw the star. They came over to Jerusalem and we'll see a bit later. I think the star appears again. It's not just always in the sky. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, so he finds out from them that Christ is going to be born in Bethlehem. He says, hey, he's trying to find out how old this child is going to be. That's why he's asking about, hey, when did this star appear that you saw that you came over um, to Jerusalem to look for him? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So he's obviously trying to trick them to say, Hey, tell me where he is because I want to go worship him. But we see later that he actually tries to kill the Lord Jesus in the flesh. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So it seems like when they go, I don't know whether the star appears again, but see, what I think here, and obviously this is just my opinion, because some people believe that this star in the east is actually a star that's in the sky. Whereas the reason why I don't think it is, I think it's some supernatural light that they thought was a star that actually came over the house because if you think about it right if it was just a bright star in the sky and you were traveling and following that star how would you know which house it's pointing out right so i have i i believe it's probably like some supernatural light that was actually guiding them and stood over the house so they knew exactly which house to go into because if they came to the town of bethlehem and the star is just in the sky and it's just a brighter star than the other stars are up there which house do they know to go into right so just a thought there. So I, I, that's why I don't know whether the star's always there and they're just following this star like a carrot that's in front of them or whether like it disappeared. That's why, because if the star was always in the sky, we would have just led them all the way to Jerusalem, right? Uh, all the way to Bethlehem. But I think it led them to uh, Jerusalem. Maybe they saw it in the east, they came to ask. And then when they left to go to Bethlehem, they rejoiced when they saw the star again. And they're like, hey, there it is. And they went, follow the star. And the star actually led them to the specific house as opposed to just being another of the stars in the, in the heavens, um, like we see in the night sky. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, so this is, I, I, and for those of you who have heard me preach about Christmas, I think, think it's interesting here that, you know, when the wise men go to see Jesus, and remember, we're not told how many wise men there are. So it's not just, it's not that there's three kings. These are wise men. We don't know how many they are. They came and they come into the house. So when you see those nativity scenes at Christmas, I know Ashton already knows this, but when you see those nativity scenes at Christmas, the wise men shouldn't be in that nativity scene in the stable because Jesus was born in the stable, right? But the wise men aren't there. They come a lot later when Jesus is already in the house with Mary and that's when he visits 
Um, uh, that's when the wise men visit Jesus and Jesus is in the house with his mother. When they were coming to the house, so they're not in the stable, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So this is why the wise men are always represented as three wise men because of the three different gifts. And a lot of people believe that those, these gifts have different meanings, you know, gold representing, you know, his, his uh, kingship. Frankincense is like an incense. It sort of represents the fact that he's our priest. He's our high priest. And myrrh is supposedly like a, 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 an essence that they use for balming people. So it's, it's meant to be a prefigure of his death, right? So um, that's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream. So God warns these wise men in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed into their own country another way. So they didn't go back through Jerusalem to go back to the east, right? They went another way because they were warned by God not to go back there. God obviously knowing what Herod's plans were to kill Jesus. Um, uh, Herod didn't, uh, Herod didn't, the wise men obviously didn't know that. All right, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now, I want you to, show, I want you to realize this. See, Joseph, he, he is approached by God in a dream at night. And look at what it says in verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So when God approached Joseph and said, hey, you need to flee into Egypt, he gave him a command. Did Joseph delay to obey that command? No, he, he arose up, it was still dark, and he packed up, he took his, uh, his wife and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very careful to say that it's not his son, right? He took the young child and his mother, so the child's mother by night, because he's not the father of that child, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, what I always think about when I read about Joseph, you know, getting this dream, you know, he's obviously a very faithful man, he's obeying God, goes into Egypt. Do you, th do you think he realized that he was fulfilling prophecy when he went into Egypt? I don't know. But something I think is interesting, whether he thought he was fulfilling, when he, whether he knew he was fulfilling these prophecies. So this prophecy that out of Egypt have I called my son, this is from Hosea 11.1. 1. It says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now what I find is interesting about all these prophecies in Matthew 2 is that you have Jesus being born in Bethlehem. He's getting called out of Egypt. Later on, we see he shall be called in Nazarene. That There's all these different places that he has to go to fulfill this prophecy, these prophecies. And it's just... You know, it, it can't just be coincidence, right? So let's go on to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So now it makes sense why he was asking him when the star appeared. And so it gives you an idea of the timeline here, because when you read through Matthew 2, you think like these things are just happening really quickly. But no, you know, the wise men are traveling down to Bethlehem. It's taking them a while and he's figuring out, okay, that's when it appeared. You know, that's, you know, they didn't come back. So the child's probably about two years old. And then he does something really wicked. And in all the coast, so he says, we seen right, sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And in all the coast, they from two years old and under, according to the time, which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So he just wipes out, tries to wipe out all the children under two. And then it says here in verse 17, Then was fulfilled which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. So this is such a tragic event here that this wicked king goes and tries to kill all these children under two years old. And anybody reading this would think, oh, this is terrible that all these innocent children are being killed. But nowadays, innocent children are being killed all the time in the womb. You know, I'm sure if we went and just killed a bunch of children under two years old, there'd be like an uproar, right? But then there's all these children in the womb getting killed. And, you know, people are for it, you know, it's, it's pro-choice. 
So this comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. So that's the second prophecy that's fulfilled um, here. And the last one we see here in the last couple of verses, verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Um, I just think it's funny because Joseph must be really worried at <laughs> this time. Every time he goes to sleep, he's either being warned or being told to do something crazy, move somewhere. Um, they are dead which sought the young child's life. Verse 21, and he arose. See, look again, no delaying to obey the voice of God. And this is how we should be as Christians. You know, when we hear that God wants us to do something, we ought to act. We ought to change immediately, just like Joseph. He arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he had heard, and when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, look at this again, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now this is interesting because if you, I'll just read a couple of chapters, uh, not a couple, a couple of verses from John, that there was some confusion over where Jesus was from, right? Because if you remember, Jesus had to fulfill these different prophecies. He was born in Bethlehem. Then he moved to Egypt because of the, of, of, you know, to, to avoid being killed. And it says, out of Egypt have I called my son. And then the Bible says he shall be called a Nazarene, right? So a lot of people believe, thought that he was from Nazareth. And we see this confusion in the Gospels. In John 7, it says here, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. So this is John 7, uh, verse 37 saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Right? This is the prophet. So they recognized Jesus as the Christ, right? The Son of God says, this is the Christ. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So why are they saying that? Because they think Jesus is from Nazareth. Nazareth is in, is in Galilee. So there's some confusion there. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. So you see how there's this confusion there because the people didn't realize, no, he was actually born in Bethlehem because... That's where Joseph went, you know, because of the taxing. He was born in Bethlehem, but then he moved to Egypt. And then when they came back, we get the story of why they ended up in Nazareth. And it was actually fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. And it's interesting because throughout the New Testament or throughout the Gospels, that's what Jesus is referred to. You know, we know him as Jesus of Nazareth, not as Jesus of Bethlehem. And that even... If we turn to just John 19 really quickly, just the last verse. In John 19, we read here what was actually put on the sign above Jesus when he was crucified. And look at this. This is a fulfillment as well of the, of the scripture that he would be called a, a Nazarene, that even when in his death he is recognized. It says, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So that's Matthew 2, you know, just seeing Jesus fulfill these Old Testament scriptures. You know, Joseph being that faithful man, you know, as God approaches him, he just is ready to obey. And we ought to be like that as Christians as well. And we see here the different places that Jesus went to and he came from as a baby fulfilling those scriptures. Uh, you know, the Bible truly is uh, unique and different to, to, to other books. All right, I hope that was a blessing to you and you learned something a little bit different from that chapter. I know it's a really familiar chapter. Let's pray and then we're going to break up into groups. I've, got, um, I've already got everything marked out. So the guys will pray first. We'll, we'll go down and pray first and then um, the ladies can pray. All right, let's pray. 
All right, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Um, just thank you for the Lord Jesus coming and such a supernatural birth, Lord, with all the different scriptures being fulfilled. Um, the historical crosshairs, Lord, thank you for, you know, we know um, that we have this, this uh, assurance that the Bible is a true historical account of what happened. Thank you, Lord, that we have something that is so different to all the other false religions out there. And we just thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ for coming, dying again for us. And pray, Lord, that you bless our time together as we pray. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.